Yep, I'm here. There you go. Hi, everyone. Uh, well, welcome to our webinar, Making Qualification Verification Work For You. I might actually shorten that to QV because it's quite a tongue twister when you have to say it a few times. But uh, just to let you know you're in the right room. I'm Debbie Gibb. I'm a Quality Enhancement Manager and I'm joined today by Juliet McGinley, um, who's a Senior Operations no. Manager. This topic was raised, um, requested when we asked centres to tell us what they would like following our last series of CPD events, centre coordinators. And we know that many centre coordinators worry about their external verification events, systems and qualification based. And this has been exacerbated by the recent necessity to conduct um, remote and virtual verification in place of physical visits. You may be worrying as well about your capacity for the new technology and ICT, ICT skills. Uh, today, we aim to help alleviate some of these concerns and provide you with more confidence when preparing for your external verification. So we're going to take you through two fairly fast and fun activities designed to help you understand how we select our samples and why you should work collaboratively with your external verifiers to prepare for verification and the benefits for both of us if you do so. You'll have the opportunity to discuss with other coordinators how you currently prepare for verification activity and what you could improve on now that we're all getting used to working virtually. So we're aiming in this next hour or so to address any concerns that you have about qualification verification, explain how this differs from systems verification and the essential relationship between the two. Let me introduce the team of seven quality enhancement managers who, in addition to other quality assurance activities, we conduct systems approval and systems verification at your centres. Many of you will have already met at least one of us. When we conduct systems verification, quality enhancement managers look at a larger range and number of quality assurance criteria than qualification verifiers do. This is because we are looking at all your quality assurance mechanisms, your policies, your procedures, your documented processes, roles, responsibilities, regardless of what type and how many qualifications you offer. So in a nutshell, if you have effective ways of reviewing your quality assurance systems, policies, procedures, using our guidance and your centre staff all understand and apply these consistently to all your activities, for example, candidate induction, new staff induction, internal verification, keeping your records, managing your data, then you can be confident that your outcomes for qualification verification, QV, should be successful. I'm now going to hand you over to Juliet, who will introduce your first activity, and I'll see you again in one of the breakout rooms. Morning, everyone. My name is Juliet McGinley. I'm one of the senior operations managers, and I have the responsibility for the deployment of qualification verification activity. Now, I'm just going to give you um, a little bit of warning. This is the first time we have used Teams to move into breakout rooms, so you are my guinea pigs. So. There will be a slight delay in moving us into the different teams, so just bear with us and um, we hope it all works fine. So we'll move you into that in a wee second. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to just share with you um, the overview of what we're going into the team to do. Now, we've got a lot to cover today. Um, we normally do this in an hour. We have got an hour and a half, though, and we have added on a presentation to the centre hub which I'll explain what that is and where it's come from. And you'll get to see that it went live last Friday. So for those of you who have already connected with us on that, you'll get to get a walkthrough of it. And for those of you, you'll get to see what's coming. Um, so we have a couple of activities. The first one, you'll get broken into groups um, and then we will ask someone to take the feedback and provide feedback when we come back into the main room. And the second activity today is more about discussion. We won't be looking for feedback. I will give you an overview of the discussion and how it will work for both of us. The main aim of today is to relax, have a bit of fun, because um, the first workshop is definitely a bit of fun. And if you're a fan of whiskey, you're actually going to like this one. Um, not that I'm giving you whiskey. Obviously, in a virtual world, that's impossible, but we can talk about it. Um, so please relax, have a bit of fun. Bear with us while we move everyone about into the different groups. And before I do that, I will give you an overview. So. Angel Shear, and for those of you who have seen the film, you'll know exactly what we're talking about whiskey. So what I'm going to ask you to do in your groups is we will share a document of whiskies, different types of whiskies from across the countries, and we're going to ask you to put together a tasting night for a group of tourists. I want you to choose your whiskies, 
why you've chose those whiskies, and what we're going to ask you to do is feedback on why you chose the specific whiskies that you've chosen. So there will be one person in the group. I'm taking one group. Debbie will take the other group. We'll move into them anytime um, in a second. But someone within the group, I would like you to take the responsibility for feeding back. So remember, it's a group of tourists. We've given you a range of whiskies to choose from. And we want you to choose the whisky for the tasting night of the tourists and give us an explanation as to why you've chosen them. Leanne, can you move us into our breakout rooms, please? Everyone, please don't panic. It'll take a few seconds, so please don't think we've cut you off. Hopefully we won't have done. Yeah, I think it's on mute. Debbie, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can everyone see me, hear me? Yeah. 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 So I'm going to get your group to feedback first. Who did you get okay. to do the feedback? Um, well, we had Gordon Gibb, who um, I think volunteered or was volunteered. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, there was a good discussion going on, but I'll let, I'll let him carry on from now. That's great. Can I ask everyone else just to go on mute? And Gordon, can you come on camera and unmute yourself and give us a wee bit of feedback, please? Right, it was quite hard, the discussion we had to start, because we didn't have a lot of whiskey drinkers in the group. I don't drink whiskey myself, but I do work in distilleries, so it did help me a little bit. So the first question we had to look at was the audience that was going to go for. So again, we looked at the cost value, because not a lot of people's got 100,000 to spare. And that's just one of the mid-range whiskies you can get. So we looked at the cost in for a start to see what they're going because they're going to be visitors, they're not going to have that much money going around with them, but I do know they do spend it. So, and then we have to look at the variety of whiskies. Again, is it going to be a single malt? Is it going to be a blend? So again, we had to look at that as what the customer required. Again, it's, we looked very much at what we would drink ourselves or how we would like it to be marketed. So we looked at the costs, the variety, and therefore we selected the Glen Morangi. Again, it's because it's got our vast range from single malts to blended. Same with Glenfiddich. Glenfiddich is a large producer, again, well known. And again, it does the vast ranges from 12 year old right up to 30 year old malts. And Johnny Walker for the blends. Again, you've got the different groups. It has that important in the process for it. We then looked at the small suppliers because again, it's what we need to promote as a small person as well. So you've got like our bag, who's got a very smoky flavour, reasonably priced in the, in the marketplace, really. Row & Co, because again, we want to promote UK nations, Scotland, England, Ireland, Wales. So Ireland comes in there. So again, it lets them see the varieties we've got. And the last one we picked was actually Hunter Lang, which is a small distillery which has got a lot of nice products. It's well packaged, anything like that. So that was the debate we had, <laughs> discussion we, we tried to get through. That's great. <laughs> That's great. Thank you very much, Gordon. That's absolutely fantastic. Can I ask Jen from our group to give an overview of our discussions? Yeah, sure. Um, and interesting is interestingly, we, we we're sort of quite opposite <laughs> to to Gordon's group. Well, we were quite keen to try the hundred thousand <laughs> uh, whiskey, and and we, and we had a bit of an expert in our group with Juliet, who seemed to know a lot about whiskey, so she was <laughs> really good. Um, we had similar discussions about areas um, and locations of distilleries and things like that. Um, we decided though. Um, we wouldn't taste the Dublin ones because uh, the tourists were, were in Scotland, so they wanted to taste uh, Scottish whiskey. That's why they were there. And and um, we we actually went for um, uh, an expensive one, um, the uh, uh, Bowmore Black. Uh, because uh, number one, it was very rare and it was the last cask. Um, and uh, so it's a real experience uh, for the tourists, but also uh, that we think the tourists, you know, if they're sort of groups of Americans or uh, Chinese or Japanese tourists, um, they have a lot of money uh, to spend. Um, so, you know, it's something they might potentially be interested in. Um, we also uh, wanted to try, uh, the tourists to try a relatively expensive, um, um, uh, inexpensive, uh, sorry, uh, whiskey. So we went for the Glenfiddich. Um, 
and um, also uh, to promote some smaller distilleries, the Ardnaho, uh, which is a, a new distillery, and the Tomatool, which is uh, not very well known. Uh, and we also threw in um, a Johnny Black uh, because American, it's very popular in America. So the American tourists, uh, it might be something they were interested in um, and would help, you know, sort of boost sales and things like that, which is sort of the, the point of the tourism. So, so that's where we landed on all of ours. That's great. Thank you very much, Jen. Thanks, Jen and Gordon and everyone for taking part. So the theory behind this, one, you'll never forget it because we talked about whiskey at great length and um, it was a bit of fun. It was interesting to see the different uh, rationales behind why you approached the different whiskies and why you chose to do different things. And essentially, the, the main method of this is to try and tie it into what our EVs do, not whiskey, but what our EVs do when they're sampling and choosing a sample to verify at centres. So I'm just going to share my screen again with you all and I'll work through and bear with me. It's not going to be a long presentation, but just a couple of different things. One of probably the best kept secrets um, and centres are probably um, unsure about and which has been raised as why it's part of the CPD event is how our EVs approach sampling. We all approach choices in the same manner. We all have a rationale as to why we choose things. We all have intelligence that feeds us in a certain direction and our EVs are absolutely no different. The one main thing we have to remember though when we're talking about sampling is, oh, and here's the screen, it's a sample. And what does sample mean? There is that, that, um, that area where people try to think, I can take everything and I can try everything and I can do everything, but you actually can't because QV activity is within a time frame. And you know that an EB attending your centre to look at, whether it's virtual or actually visiting, is looking at a proportionate amount of a candidate evidence to make a judgment on the assessor judgments. They're not there to reassess your portfolios, they're there to look at the assessment judgments that have been made by your assessors and IBs. So we encourage them to choose a sample. And what's a sample? A small part. I think you'll see through what's on screen that it's a small amount, a small amount to try something, a small amount to decide what you like. It's a small amount. And that's something that you, as part of a centre... For a second, you're not sharing your screen at the moment. Oh, why did it go down? Oh, can you see screen. it now? That's can it. That's it. Yeah, excellent. Sorry. Apologies for that. It I thought you down. intended to do that, Jules. Sorry, I thought that was intentional. Or I wouldn't have said anything. <laughs> no, not at all. Um, I don't know why it didn't come up. So what does the word sample mean? It basically is a small amount. So we encourage our EVs to choose a small amount of a candidate portfolios because they're there to make a judgment on the assessor judgment. So they're there to make a decision on those assessors' judgments, they're not there to plow through hundreds and hundreds of candidate portfolios. So just to tell you how we approach that, it's based on risk, it's based on information and intelligence. They look at what has been previously verified, assessors that have been previously verified, units and group awards that have been previously verified, what their outcome was, how many um, locations you're delivering it for at, uh, whether it's a new qualification, whether you've got new assessors and verifiers that are delivering the qualification for the first time. So there's loads of different things that come into play when they're making a sample. In exactly the same way that you made a decision on which whiskies you were going to choose, whether you're going to take the, the expensive range, the, the cheaper range, the different ranges of location, who your audience was going to be, and so on and so forth, it's exactly the same. These are some of the risk factors. Look at assessors and verifiers, qualification, new qualifications, revised qualifications, location of delivery and assessment. We have centres that have multiple assessment sites and some of them are across the country and across the world. The mode of delivery, so they could have full-time candidates, part-time candidates, which will have different people involved. Number of candidates, number of groups, so that, um, how many assessors a candidate, uh, how many candidates an assessor has. And intelligence from systems verification reports or SVs are in there looking at the, the policies and procedures that are in place within a centre and that can highlight whether there's potential issues in certain areas that we feed all that into our intelligence of sampling. 
So sampling isn't just something we put our finger up in the air and just go, well, we'll just choose that and there we go. It is actually based on intelligence in exactly the same way as our selections for qualification are based on intelligence. We are based, we have regulated qualifications that we must verify every year, but we also have a whole range of our self-regulated qualifications that we determine who and what we're going to verify based on a whole range of intelligence not dissimilar to this. So sampling is no longer a mystery to you. There is an approach to it, but you have a part to play in that. And your part to play in that is as an SQA coordinator or from an SQA coordinator's perspective, it may be hand down to some course teams to be involved in the QB. You have to engage with our EVs. You have a part to play. You can, incur, you can um, have a, a participation in the sampling and in the QB activity. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to move on here and talking about preparing, planning and the process. There's three topics. I'm going to put you out into breakout rooms again. I'm not going to ask for them to provide feedback, but what I'm hoping to do is start a discussion. Part of the CPD event was that we were asked the questions of how does visit planning take place? How does it work? What's my role in it and how do I engage in it? How moving into the virtual world, virtual verification has become something that is, there is an element of fear in it as to how that's going to work and how our EVs are going to carry out our verification activity in the virtual world. So we can have discussions about that. And there has also been feedback that some people just don't understand what our QB reports mean and how, what they do if things don't go to according to plan or they don't match what the feedback was at the centre. So I'm just going to quickly show you the three main points we're going to discuss when we go into our breakout rooms. Now, the whole purpose of this activity is to allow you to discuss with other coordinators and other centres how or what you think your approach is or what you think your responsibility is in relation to these activities when an EB has been alloc uh, allocated to your centre to undertake a qualification verification. And then a lot of the methodology is exactly the same within systems verification. Systems verification, as Debbie mentioned earlier on, is very much about policies and procedures and making sure that the structure is there to ensure appropriate um, delivery and assessment of our qualifications. What we are doing at qualification verification is ensuring that that is implemented and that the delivery and assessment meets the requirements of the standards to ensure the integrity of our certification. So three main topics, preparing for qualification verification, um, undertaking the virtual event and receiving your QB report. When you go into your breakout room, there's a document that will be shared on screen. It has a few prompters, but basically I'm hoping that you will all participate and you are the main speakers in these rooms. And it's not myself or Debbie um, leading the road. I'm going to sit back and uh, Debbie will do the same. So, Eliane, can you take us into our breakout rooms again, please? Hello and welcome back. OK, um, so what I'm going to do now, Hello. going to, oh, can I just ask everyone to put their mics back on mute um, so we don't get any? That's perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, what I will say is, as we go through these, if there's any questions at all, there will be opportunity at the end for us to talk through those. Um, but you can pop a message into the message box and we'll pick that up at the end as well. If anything springs to mind as we're walking through it. So what I'm going to do now, and I'm hoping everyone can see my screen this time. <laughs> Someone nod and let me know. Yeah. Anyone? Yep. Yeah, we yep. Can. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. So qualification verification planning. Just to make you aware that qualification verification planning is not done to you. You are, as an SQA coordinator, a participant in this activity. You have a responsibility to liaise when you've been contacted by an EB to liaise with your team of assessors and IBs to determine how that activity plays for your centre. You have an involvement in that. You get to be involved in when it's arranged, how evidence is going to be uploaded, what the virtual event is going to look like, if you're sending evidence before and so on and so forth. You don't get a date put to you. If you have an EV that says to you, I'm only available on Fridays and Fridays are of no use to you, then please get back in touch with SQA because that's not what this is about. A date should be mutually agreed. It's about what, what is suitable for your uh, centres and what's suitable for the EV. And in some qualifications, there are certain qualifications like taxi qualifications um, and emergency first aid at work, where sometimes the EV would like to see a live assessment being observed 
so they may want to work into a date where a live assessment is taking place in your centre. We talked about sampling quite heavily earlier on. It's up to you about what information. Remember, our EVs are there to determine a judgment against your assessor judgments. They're looking at the judgments that have been made by your assessors to ensure the consistency across all your assessors. The sample has to be proportionate to that. If you don't have candidate evidence available at that time, then you can make the visit appropriate to when you have enough evidence to provide that EV. It's also down to you as well. Qualification verification doesn't get done to you. Qualification verification can be done with you. We have lots of centres that get in touch with us when an EB gets in touch with them to say, I think I've got a couple of problems here. I'm delivering across multiple assessment sites and it would be good if you picked up this assessment site because I've got a new assessor in here or I think I've got a couple of problems with the delivery of that. I've had a couple of issues with candidates feeding back to us. So it would be good if you concentrated in that area. And we will take that on board as we, as we work through a sample. It may be that a couple of candidates are sampled from that, including another sample as well. Because we're moving into the virtual world, it's really, really important where possible. Some qualifications, for instance, beauty, we have to see the resource environment as to how you're going to deliver. You're telling us that you're going to have a room with five sinks in it and the requirements of the qualifications say that you must have five sinks in it. And I'm using a really bad example. However, we need to be able to see that. So it's either a tour of the actual resource where that um, beauty is going to take place or it's a video or photographs of that activity because an EV has to be comforted that you are providing the appropriate accommodation for that candidate who's going in to be taught within your centre. So it's really important for you as a coordinator to engage with the EV from the very beginning of the planning process. Don't let an EV dictate the way forward. Is about a mutually agreed. It's about working the sample. It's about working the day, arranging the activity, how you plan the day's event to take place and how you work around all that. So please engage. An EV will keep you right. There's a qualification verification guidance for centres, which has just been published and it's on our website. And it talks about the SQA coordinator responsibilities through the qualification verification activity. And a lot of the methodology we're talking about also relates to systems verification as well. It's a partnership. We want to work in partnership with the centres. We don't want centres to fear qualification or systems verification. It's about engaging and working in um, partnership. Our main aim, as you know, is always to maintain the national standards of our qualifications. We want to ensure that our certificates are valid, whether they're delivered in your centre or 15 other centres across the country. The same level of assessment is taking place to the same standard of the qualification. So how do you prepare? We talked earlier on in our group about giving access to EVs evidence much earlier on. And I'm going to show you this SQA Centre Hub. Obviously, our activities in the past have always been visiting. It's rare that we do remote. Remote tends to be done in our very low risk qualifications. We are um, we must, through regulation, uh, verify a lot of our regulated qualifications annually. And sometimes when we go into centres, there's four or five years of high confidence reports and we've verified all the assessors, all the IVs, but as a regulator, we're told to verify again. So sometimes we take that down to a reduced criteria and do a remote verification there. In the virtual world, what we've done is we've taken our visiting criteria and transferred it into a virtual platform. But the beauty is that we've now created the Centre Hub for Evidence Upload, which means you can give our EB access to evidence well in advance, and that reduces the activity and the burden within your centre on staff on the day of the virtual event. At the virtual event, it will focus on assessor um, discussions, IBs, uh, interviews with candidates, and it allows you, our EBs to have more discussion with centre staff and to have that discussion and provide um, feedback. Discussions with assessors, IBs and candidates are really important to us because it gives us an insight as to the delivery of the qualifications. So we would ask in the virtual world that that still uh, takes place where it's feasibly possible. It also takes the pressure off any technology issues on the day. You know, giving an EV access to a system on the day of the event run high has its own risks that systems may go down, Wi-Fi may go down, platforms may um, freeze. Whereas if they've got access to evidence well in advance, then any issues of that can be uh, worked through in advance of the virtual event. So, the virtual events. 
the beauty of it and the beauty of the virtual world, and let's just say we've bought right into this, and I don't think we'll ever go back to full visiting, um, even when the world opens up and it goes back on its axis in a normal fashion. It allows us to get more than one EB in the group into a virtual event. If you deliver HNs or National Progression Awards or uh, Professional Development Awards, they can often be made up of multiple different verification groups and we do multiple activities for them. So we'll select an EV to look at one verification group, select an EV to look at another, and all these activities go on. The aim and the beauty of virtual activity is that we can get all that done at one time. All the evidence can be submitted in, looked by the, uh, the individual EVs, and then we can bring them together to one virtual event with your centre. You can get assessors uh, and IVs available throughout those couple of hours of activity, and it means we are actually reducing the burden on your centre staff and your centre for the multiple activities that we would normally do. We can do it all under one. Discussions can take place in the virtual platform and you get one report back rather than multiple reports as well. So it has its benefits, the virtual platform. A lot of centres coming forward for approval for these qualifications have to are often provided with four or five E's getting in touch with them to discuss the approval content or the verification activity. This way you'll have one EV getting in touch with you who will coordinate all the other EVs involved so that the contact for you is one EV, one virtual event and one report back. So it gives us that ability to open the scope. Trying to get four or five EVs together at one event in a visiting world is very, very difficult. To do it in a virtual platform is much, much easier. It's a more effective use of your centre staff and it's absolutely a more effective use of our EVs as well and it cuts that um, time. So rather than you having staff available from nine o'clock in the morning to five o'clock at night, you potentially could have staff available for half an hour within a three hour virtual event to give them feedback and discussions and to discuss the evidence pre previously provided. And I'm hoping they'll also make sure that we have the appropriate people ready at the feedback session. Sometimes what we have is we have staff who come in at the morning, set up the, the event, and then they're not available for the feedback session because they've got other things going on. That Through the virtual platform, they can maybe jump in, see the virtual event, and then go back into what they're doing. So the virtual world has opened up a lot of scope for us all. Just to touch on, within my group, the feedback was um, good, standardised and consistent, so that's always nice to hear back. However, there are times when things go wrong with the qualification report. The qualification report is there to be a reflection of what took place at the actual event. It must absolutely reflect the feedback that your assessors and IVs have been given and the feedback at the end of the event. So it's really, really important that you understand the QB report and you know what it means. So just a couple of points of clarity um, in case anyone doesn't know. A required action is something that must be done by the centre. It must be uh, the actions must be undertaken because that's against the criteria of non-compliance, and you have to ensure that you meet that compliance against the criteria in line with the national standards. A recommendation, however, does not require actions with centres. Recommendations are given to EVs as a potential enhancement to your delivery, so it may be something that they have seen as good practice in another centre and they want to share with you and say other centres are doing this. This is something that might be make your life a bit easier if you could do this and we can give you the documentation, so on and so forth to help. But recommendations are absolutely exactly that. You do not have to action them. So only required actions must be dealt with. It is also your part in the process is to get, agree the time frame to meet those required actions. You don't have an EV telling you it must be done by a week on Friday. It's up to you to ha take part in that discussion through the feedback session and agree a date and a time frame that is not going to have your centre running about, putting stress on um, assessors and IVs and candidates to get that information ready or for reassessments to take place. You mutually agree that required action with that EV. So you are engaged from the beginning of an allocation of a QB activity right through the planning, right through the event and also in the report when the report comes back out to you to make sure it's a true reflection of the activity. QB activity should be something that you actually are keen to get. It should be there to highlight any areas where they need a bit of work, but also highlight good practice and allow you to feed that back through to your centre as well. It's a partnership between SQA and centres. It's not SQA out there to audit and dictate. 
It's about making sure we're all working to the same aim. We all want to make sure our candidates are certificated with a certificate of value. So there are additional um, contact details there for you to get in touch with us if anything does go wrong through the process. And you can also contact our QEB team if you require additional support. So that if there is an area or a subject that you think I'm really struggling or my assessors are struggling or we're not getting a handle on it, then you can get in touch with us and we can start to provide you with some support. So please don't hesitate to do that. And in the virtual world, it makes it so much easier because we can then get multiple people in the room to have those virtual discussions and provide support and feedback. Um, and our, our qualification verification is very much about developmental as well. It's not just about us coming out there to measure compliance, it's about supportive and developmental as well. And we've gone to great lengths over the last four or five years to ensure that our EVs take that approach. However, we have over 500 appointees, I'm going to say. Um, we, I'm not saying that we have them all singing from exactly the same hymn sheet. That is our main aim, is to get everyone doing exactly as we, uh, we um, advise. So if anything does go wrong, please feed back to us. It's really important that you feed back to us. It's not that you're telling tales or it's not that you're doing anything untowards. For us to ensure that standardisation and consistency of approach takes place, we need that feedback from centres to tell us where it's going wrong and we can correct that and we can take that on board. So, I'm not going to go through all that. I've just talked through all that. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to move us into the world of Centre Hub. I'm going to open up the floor for two or three minutes for questions, but there will be an area for questioning at the end. And I'm going to put the Centre Hub up for you. So, please feel free. I'm just going to check through the text to make sure there's no questions that I've missed. And see. Okay. Does anyone want to ask any questions while I work getting the centre hub up? Jules, I have said that um, we can always answer questions. If people need to leave, we can actually go through them and get back to people if they haven't managed Absolutely. to stay on, but that we will take all these ones in the chat box and, um, and go through them, make sure everybody does get an answer. Right, for those of you who want to stay on, I'm going to work my way through the Centre Hub. The SQA Centre Hub was created as a digital uh, platform. Please, please be aware that there is nothing hosted in the, uh, the Centre Hub. It is a conduit. See it very much as a gateway of getting your evidence into SQA. It is not held here. There are no GDPR issues. There is no potential breach of evidence being seen by anyone else. It is very much a platform to get evidence into SQA. It allows you to submit your evidence in your portfolios for systems verification and for qualification verification in advance of a QB activity once you've agreed the sample that has been required through the visit planning process. So I'm just going to share my screen with you again and hope it works. Can everyone see that? Yep, yeah, excellent. Yeah. So yes, that's fine. The good news is the Centre Hub went live last Friday. It took us a bit of time to get there, but we have gone live. We have over 100 centres now um, accessing it. It is very much a conduit to get your evidence into SQA, <clears throat> and that was the main aim of it. But being us, we also managed to get a couple of extra um, benefits in there for centres as well, which I hope you think will be useful. So even for those centres who, who use their own digital platforms, you absolutely can continue to use them. This is an, op this is an option for centres. It's not something that we're saying you must sign up to. Everyone will be invited. All SQA coordinators will be invited in the first instance. If you want additional centre and um, people within your centre to get access to it, then drop us a line to qeb at sqa.org.uk and we'll make sure that we get those people terms and conditions sent out to accept it. Please don't share usernames and passwords amongst your centre. Please just get them access in their own right, and that way we can control the access and ensure, ensure the security. So the Centre Hub was created. There is a video to show you how to navigate it. However, we will be doing drop-in sessions in the next few months, over the next few months, sorry, to allow centres to drop in and say, can you show me this? And we'll be doing a uh, retraining programmes on it as well. But we did put together a video of how to navigate it. So very simple and very simplistic. It's opened up and it's been created to all centres. 
our employer training providers in Scotland, all our employer training providers in the rest of the UK, which is England, Ireland and Wales, our international centres and our Scotland's colleges. Um, the only centres that we don't allow access to this because they have their own area is our Chinese centres. They have their own hub available to them, which has been in play for the last four or five years. So I'll drop into these areas in a second. What we've also got down here is an area for guidance. I am aware that sometimes working your way through SQA's website can be a bit tricky and we have information all over the place. So what we've done is we've linked some of what we think are the important documents relating to quality assurance and under the guidance. So there are quick links on supporting web page links. There are guidance documentation links. There should be a quick one stop shop for you to be able to go in and find what you're looking for in there. If there's anything at all missing in there that you think it would have been really handy if I could have seen, drop an email and I'll put an email up at the end for you to be able to drop any of those concerns over to. So we will add to that and we'll build on that as we go through and get feedback from centres. The other area that we are aware of, and this is a work in progress, is communication. We are very much aware that SQA over during COVID-19 has sent a huge amount of uh, communications out and centres are getting confused as to where they can find it. Some people are missing it. It goes into centre news. It's always on our website. There are areas on our website um, set up primarily for HN and VQ. However, we thought it would be beneficial to have a one-stop communication area as well. And we're going to add in all the past six months worth of um, um, centre news communications so that you can work your way through them as well. So we'll put all current up-to-date communications that are issued out from SQA. We're copied into them now and we'll be putting them up in the communication area so that you have a one-stop shop as well to see what's the most recent information from SQA. What is the most inf uh, the recent information being distributed? For centres who are delivering foundation apprenticeships, you'll see a wee coming soon. That's a, an area we're going to have specifically for foundation apprenticeships. So we are aware that foundation apprenticeships have exploded over the last year. We now have pathway apprenticeships have been um, rolled out um, from SDS. We have foundation apprenticeships. We've created new customised units in the framework and so on and so forth. So we thought it would be very beneficial to have an area for foundation apprenticeships for a lot of our centres to be able to tap into. So again, you can see the most up to date information and the most current news in their foundation apprenticeship qualifications. So. That's the news area. What we have, and I'll click into Scotland's employers and training providers, you have the opportunity to upload evidence for systems verification and qualification verification. And an additional, what I think is an absolute beauty, is we have a shared QA documentation. How many times as a centre are you frustrated that you have to give an EV a copy of their IV document to multiple different EVs? So as part of qualification verification quality assurance criteria and part of systems verification quality assurance criteria, as systems will ask for a copy of the IV uh, policy and document. They're looking at the content of it to make sure it's fit for purpose. Our EVs will ask for that very same document to ensure that it's been implemented against the qualification that they're verifying. So whatever your IV schedule is, your IV policy is, our EVs want to see that document. So what we've done is we've created a shared QA documentation area that you can upload your most recent documents that are asked across multiple EVs, multiple systems with uh, verification activities, and hopefully in the future as we start to add additional areas in here, approval and prior verification, that you will be able to share that document once. And that way our EVs can tap into it and you don't have to keep uploading it as evidence to multiple different people. If you, your document gets replaced, and your document gets updated, all you do is you go back in, upload your most up-to-date one, and we'll systematically housekeep it and take out your older ones. And it'll be, bit, it'll be date stamped, so we'll know which one's your most up-to-date documentation. So uh, hopefully that will take away that burden of having to keep sending the same documentation to multiple different EVs and the frustration that that causes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk through a qualification verification upload since we're talking about qualification verification. The systems verification documentation is pretty much the same. Questions may be slightly different, but it's the same simple process. So you click on the forum because you want to upload evidence. You've been contacted by an EB. You've worked through the visit planning schedule. You've agreed your sample of candidate evidence that's going to be provided for the event. 
and you put in your name, your centre number, every activity we have for qualification verification has an event ID. When we allocate an activity to your centre, we drop an email out to your centre to advise you who the EB is going to be that's going to get in touch with you. And within that email, there is an event ID. When we send you a copy of the visit plan, the visit plan has the event ID, the qualification verification report has the event ID, and the Microsoft Teams virtual event will be led by the event ID. So you're getting the, the theme here. The event ID is a unique identifier and it allows our EBs to be able to see I've been allocated this event ID. When you upload this evidence, a notification is sent to them to advise them evidence for that event ID has been uploaded and they can then access what we call our EB Evidence Hub, which is linked to this, and look at the evidence for that activity. You also get a notification back to you. So you fill in all the information, as you know. You let us know if you've updated, if you've uploaded anything within the shared QA documentation, because that gives an that gives a, a prompt to the EB to be aware there is documentation in there to go and have a look at it. Pop any questions you have, and the EB will pick them up. Coordinate your name, and then all you do is click on upload. You can upload pictures. You can see I've been testing the system and tried to upload no, lots of pictures and videos. You upload your um, thingy. Click on the mute button here, send me an email, receipt of my response, and hit submit, and it goes. Now, the system will allow 10 files to be uploaded at a time. If you have more than 10 files, you just go back in, create another form, and upload it. As long as you put the unique identifier in there, the event ID, they will all be linked for that activity. You'll get an email notification for each one if you tick the box and request it, and that can be kept. And in future days, you can click on it and see exactly what you submitted to SQA at that time. So you have a record of what has been submitted. Our EV then goes away. We get notified the EV that the evidence is there and they access our evidence hub and they then review the evidence and they're ready for the virtual event. If there's additional evidence that needs to be um, submitted, you can go back in and create another form and submit the evidence and we'll get a notification again to tell us that you've submitted more evidence and we let our EV know that there's additional evidence in there. So it's a very simplistic way and we did trial it and I'm going to be honest with you and say that when we trialled it, we touched on some of our centres who do not have great technology and the respect of self-confessed, please don't make me do online duels because it makes me nervous and we use them as our guinea pigs to test the system. And they came back saying, very simple, very easy, straightforward. Even I managed to do it. So we're hoping that that opens it up and allows loads and loads of centres to access the platform. So that's the Centre Hub. I'm going to take my screen down now. And I'm going to open up to questions. Please feel free, just pop your hand up if you want to ask a question. Gordon. Just a quick one, Julia. We said it was 10 files. Yeah. How big are files? Um, now you're asking, um, I think the one gigabyte files, Gordon. Again, because again, if we're moving into technology, a lot of the videos are going to be quite large, especially. Yeah. What what we've done is we've actually trialled it with um, one of our bigger centres and candidate evidence, which was very practical in our construction industry. And I think only one file failed on is one of the bigger video files that failed. And we've dealt with that through, um, um, we've, we've decided that SharePoint will allow what it allows and we just have to deal with anything else as a small exception. And so far it has just been small exceptions. So yeah, I totally get, but well, it's all SharePoint will allow us at the moment and it's a platform we have available to us. So we will manage that. If something fails, just get in touch with us and we'll pick that up and make sure we get that into us and um, make it easy for you. Perfect. Thank you. Also very quiet. <laughs> Hi there. Pauline. Hi, Pauline. Hiya. Can I just ask, is there any issue with having maybe six logins for your centre so that each kind of occupational head, if you like, yep. can access Absolutely it? fine. Right, okay. Absolutely fine, Pauline. All I would ask is that you don't share. If you get access to it, that you don't share you, your username and password. Mm -hmm. You just send me a list of the names and we'll get terms and conditions sent out to each and every one of them. 
Okay, doc. And so we can manage or who's on the system and we don't have usernames and passwords being shared. Uh -huh. Although there's nothing in here that's not really on our public website, um, we just don't want there to be um, multiple usernames being shared about. Can we start uploading evidence just now or do we need to wait till there's a, a verification visit in the pipeline? If you've got standard QA documents that are going to be shared, feel free to start uploading them. There is absolutely nothing wrong in doing that at the moment, as long as you've got access to the hub. Have you got access yeah. to the hub yet, Pauline? No, no, not yet, but I'll do it today. <laughs> right. Um, what I'll do is I'll make sure that everyone on the call today gets added on and gets terms and conditions. Um, there are multiple emails that will follow, just to give you an overview. Our digital workspace send out an email, um, and it talks about the SQA Info Centre. That is the SQA Centre Hub. Our holistic area for SharePoint is SQA Info Centre. A lot of centres, when we first submitted this out to them from our digital workspace, thought it was a fake SQA email and totally binned it. So we followed that up with an email to say, this is what this email is going to look like when it comes from digital workspace. Please don't delete it. Please respond to it. Um, so you'll get multiple emails, but I'll ensure that everyone on uh, this event and the last event that attended today that uh, will get a, a terms and conditions sent out to you. If you accept it, fine. If you don't, but please just watch over the next two or three days for anything getting into your junk. It shouldn't because it's in that sqa.org.uk email, but just in case. So we'll get that sent out to you before the end of the week. Sorry, me, me again. Not um, at all. I take it if you use electronic portfolios, the, 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 the visit would be a combination of both what you've uploaded to the hub and access to the folio system. Yeah. And part of that discussion polling would take place with your EB during the visit planning. You would advise them that you've put your generic um, QA documentation into the hub, but you're going to give them access to your digital platforms as well, which is your e-portfolios. So it's just to make sure that our EBs are aware so that they know what they're going to be accessing for evidence. So it's absolutely fine to use a combination of the both. But communication, as you probably gathered from a whole um, morning's activities, communication is key. And yep. keeping in touch and keeping your EV informed is absolutely imperative. Okay, Doc. Jen. Oh, sorry, Juliet. Um, no, I was just, um, um, I, I missed the bit, uh, you know, the form you were talking about on the hub where you yeah. indicate, you know, uh, you've uploaded documents and things like that. Um, I missed uh, how that's created. Is it the EV that creates that once the date's been agreed or is it something we create? It's something, it, the, the form is a standard template, Jen. So when you get access to the hub, you'll get access to the, the platform. You would just click into qualification verification and fill in the form, add your files and submit it. That's it's just a standard form that you would use for every QB activity you get. There's another form for systems and there's another form for shared QA. So if it's documents that you're going to share with multiple EVs and the systems verifier, you use the shared QA document. And if it's qualification, verification, candidate evidence and additional documentation, you use the QB one. And if it's systems, you use the systems. It's, it's to, we've built them that way to navigate the different platforms so that systems verifiers are going into systems and so on and so forth. And it's just to cut down. As you can imagine, under QB, we do over three and a half thousand activities a year. That's a lot of evidence coming into us. So it's to make sure that we can manage that appropriately. Definitely. And the event ID, the unique identifier of event ID is absolutely imperative. Brilliant. But that's Thank it you. to you. Brilliant. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, hi, um, Jules, it's me, Debbie. Um, I'm picking up on a message that Pauline popped into the chat box earlier about uploading evidence now or waiting until a QB in, is being arranged. And it was something that one of my centres asked earlier in the week and I'd forgotten. So this is a good place to share it in case it applies to anyone else. But um, QV has always had an event ID, but with systems, we haven't done that yet. If people want to upload into the shared document site, does that mean they don't have to have yet an, an event ID? They can no, not upload at all. For shared QA and for systems verification, we find it by centre. So uh, the reason we have an event ID for qualification verification is because you would be uploading multiple files. So there could be like 20, 30 files or it could be um, candidate evidence files and so on and so forth. For systems verification, systems verification essentially works on a rotational basis of once every three years uh, at your absolute end game. And your shared QA documentation, we would expect that to be smaller 
amount, so back to documents that you would be uploading. So um, filtering by centre is absolutely fine. Our EVs will know to go into the shared QA documentation, just filter by the centre. And what yeah. they, just so that you're aware, they will not be um, allocated evidence that doesn't relate to them. They can only see what we allocate to them. So the shared QA documentations, which are general documents, will be shared to EVs as and when they're allocated QB activity. They won't be able to see it prior to that. So as soon as they're allocated an activity and your centre uploads anything into the shared QA documentation, we'll then allocate that view to be able to view those documents at that time. They won't be able to see anything until we give them permission to see it. So just so that you're aware, multiple EVs, if you've got EVs who work at your centre, and they are out verifying other centres, they won't be able to see your evidence going in or evidence for any other centres. They will only be able to see the evidence of the centre they've been allocated that activity to. We're managing all that permissions in the background and it's to ensure there's no GDPR issues and to make sure that people aren't seeing what they shouldn't be seeing. That's brilliant, thank you. I'm sure I saw another wee hand going up. Hi there. Lauren, uh, hi. Yes. I'm uh, just wondering if um, will this kind of replace all the kind of guidance documents going up on the general website? Just kind of thinking that, you know, if you're looking for most recent versions, is it best to kind of go into the centre hub as a login or will they both be kind of mirroring each other or is it going to be absolutely links. That? The links. What we've done is we've taken all, we've went away and found all the documents that we think are relevant. So if there's any that you think we're missing, please let us know. But we've linked it to what's on the website, Lorna. So it's not a case of we've added additional documents or the most up-to-date document. We're linking it to the most up-to-date document on the website. So if nice. that changes, then the link in the hub changes as well to reflect that. Right. OK, thanks. Just okay. one question, if I okay. could ask. No problem, um, David. And it is, I've, I've, it's the idea of the centre hub just being as that ongoing, uh, not solely related to visits, you know, just a, a, an online storage area. Um, so you kind of answered my original reason for hand, having the hand up in the conversation a wee bit back. I take it that your policy documents, etc., um, it's easy to remove yes, as we absolutely. update and given the sort of the plethora of um, updates and amendments to policies we've got especially at the moment it's yeah. very fluid so just absolutely that. yeah David what we'll do is you can't actually access the documents once you've uploaded them but what yep. you can do is you can upload the more, your your next document and we'll house keep the old documents in the background so we have a full-time member of staff uh, okay. manning all this and they'll be doing the housekeeping on documents as and when they come in. So if you up, if you upload an IV document and then two weeks later you update, upload another IV document, then we will archive your original document and remove it. It can be deleted and put away because you've replaced it with a current one. So we'll be doing all the housekeeping for you. And okay. if there's any debate on any of the documents that are up there, if the names are slightly different, we would just get in touch with you to ask is that a replacement of the previous IV document you uploaded three weeks ago and so on and so forth. So we wouldn't delete anything unless we were absolutely 100% sure it was a mirror of the one that you previously updated. Fine. So I'm sort of myself, the way I manage it is never knowingly, um, you know, sort of get rid of anything policy wise, just in case. Just so in case. I typically I'm, I'm always archive. So update yeah. policy, archive the old one. Um, so that's broadly the kind of thing that you're yeah. talking about doing for me. Absolutely. Well, we're not doing it for you. Ah, well, we... you know what I mean. You know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, you, you, I mean, your, your, documentation, your documentation control is entirely up to you. But whatever yeah. you submit to us, we will make available to EVs. And if you replace that, we will archive the previous documents. I'm not sure what our archive policy is going to be, David. This is a brand yeah. new system, so I wouldn't rely on us to keep a copy of all your oh, no, archive documents. I'll be doing documents. it anyway. I'll be doing it anyway. No, yeah. that's fine. Thank you. That's great. Thanks very no much. At all. So I've got three hands up. I've got Jen, Lauren and David. I think I've answered all your questions. It's just your wee hands that are still up. Um, so if there are no more questions, I thank you all for bearing with us through an hour and 25 minutes of me talking and um, engaging with you all. So thank you very much. If there are any questions, I would just drop an email into the wee chat box.
you go. And any questions at all, just drop a wee email into that mailbox and we'll pick it up. OK, thank you very much, everyone. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very thank much. You. It was great. Thank, thank you. you. Thank everybody thank everybody for else attending and participating. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Very useful. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye.